Christ. So we're going to start um, in, in the earliest part of the Enlightenment period. The Enlightenment period leads directly into the 20th century. Okay? And that Enlightenment period um, begins with great philosophical thinkers. Um, you know, look at people like Rousseau and John Locke and, um, and uh, Hobbes. But it also has people like John Milton, who um, was a poet and a writer, okay, an author. And Milton's most famous for his work, Paradise Lost, an epic poem that um, spans you know, hundreds and hundreds of pages, which explains the fall of mankind. So it's a biblical poem, um, and it's a retelling of the war in heaven and how Adam and Eve ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil and were kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Milton wanted to write this poem in the same kinds of traditions as other sagas, um, like the Iliad and the Odyssey, or the Aeneid, or um, Beowulf. Right? And so he even invokes um, those kinds of writings. He's trying to create this very Christian narrative. In it, he creates a figure, um, and, a, and really a, a main character, and that is Lucifer. Um, I almost called him a protagonist, and that's because Lucifer features highly in, in a, as a big major character arc in the story arc throughout the story. He is still the villain, so he's not really the protagonist. Right? He is still the villain, and he's still antagonistic. The difficulty of Paradise Lost, though, is that we end up empathizing with Lucifer because Lucifer is one of the most human characters out of the whole saga. Milton has an incredible task under, and he's trying to write um, this epic, but he's trying to write from God's perspective as well. And one of his biggest problems is, is God as a character is very difficult to write because God is omnipotent and all-knowing. And then often when you read Paradise Lost, God seems very aloof and almost cold. And that's because John Milton himself is only a mortal being. He can't write as God. So he has to kind of fill in those gaps and he leaves God kind of aloof. Because of that, as the reader, we tend to not sympathize with God. We tend to sympathize more often with Lucifer. Now, Lucifer is still a bad guy, and Milton is not a, a Satan worshiper. So please don't make that mistake to think that he is somehow celebrating Satan. Satan still falls. Satan still lives in hell, the greatest punishment in the universe. But there are a couple of twists in the story, and this leads us to some of the ideas that are come up later in this little micro lecture about theism's shift to deism. And one of those biggest twists is that the way Milton writes Lucifer is Lucifer seems very much like the character Prometheus out of Greek mythology. So if you're unfamiliar with the story of Prometheus, Prometheus was a Greek god who pitied humankind. Humankind was savage. Um, they were just, you know, kind of living like, like the, all the wild animals of the world. And there was divine rule, specifically by Zeus, said uh, the gods could not teach mortal human beings the ways of the gods. Well, Prometheus pitied them, and he actually brings fire to humankind. Now, fire is symbolic, but it's also real, right? So fire allows humankind to do all kinds of things, like progress. Um, cook their meat, create weaponry and tools, and move um, into a higher level of being. But it also represents knowledge. Fire casts light in the darkness, right? And one of the most precarious times for human beings to be alive is at nighttime without protection. So what Prometheus is doing here is he's doing two things. He's allowing humankind to move into a higher level of being, but he's also giving them the symbol of knowledge. For doing this, he is punished. Zeus um, confines him to a mountainside, and an eagle comes and eats Prometheus's liver every night. And then that liver regrows in the morning, and the whole thing repeats. And this is the torture that Prometheus is given for um, showing humankind the way. Lucifer falls in a very similar way in Milton's poem. Now, Lucifer is angry with God for creating mortal beings, specifically celebrating Adam and Eve as being better. Lucifer says, I know, he's a perfect angel, 
And he literally is one of the best worshipers, the most um, highly prized of the angels by God. But when Adam and Eve are created, jealousy kind of takes hold of Lucifer. And that's one of the reasons Lucifer falls. He rebels against God out of that jealousy. And what does Lucifer do then? He goes down to the Garden of Eden, and he tries to entice Adam and Eve to do the same thing, to reject God's rule and reject authority and eat from the, the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Hence that knowledge being another connection between Prometheus and Lucifer. And Lucifer also being kind of this champion of fighting against tradition and fighting against just blind faith and authority that God, this kind of aloof character in the poem, who doesn't seem to have a real connection with his creation. So these are actually not just parts of Milton's writing, but they're also parts of Milton's questioning. Milton was questioning the dogma and the doctrines of the church of his day. Now, he's a devout Christian, but he's also got a lot of questions and issues with the way Christianity is carried out. So one of the things that Milton is kind of showing is, is that there are issues with theism. All right, so what is theism? Let's define that. Theism is the belief in a personal God, a perfect, omnipotent, all-powerful, all-knowing being, a supreme entity who meddles in the affairs and is involved with mortal beings, right? A personal God, a God that lives and, and works and communicates with his creation. That's theism. And to this day, theism is the most prominent version of religion. The three major monotheistic religions are theistic, right? So we've got uh, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. All three of those monotheistic religions believe in a personal God that you can pray to and who will uh, involve himself in the affairs of humankind. Many of the polytheistic and pantheistic religions out of the East also have personal and, and um, uh, involved gods. So, for instance, in Hinduism and Jainism and Sikhism, these all... Um, believe that God is still involved in our lives. And even teachings like the Buddhists often have uh, the gods um, active in daily life. So theism is by far the most prominent and popular version of religion. And Milton was a theist, but he was also starting to question some blind faith and the church. And this is the path toward deism. And Lucifer kind of embodies that. Again, Milton is not a, a, a Satan worshiper, so please don't make that mistake. He is simply using Lucifer as a way to question some of these ideas. And he's doing so by borrowing from the great epics and myths of history. Another theist who leans toward deism is Isaac Newton. So in this Enlightenment period, the philosophy kind of dominates the way people are supposed think about the world, how they see the world. And Isaac Newton takes it to the next level. So Newton um, not only works in logic, but he starts to work and develop a system of calculus. And the idea behind calculus is a way to measure motion. Newton's preoccupied with trying to understand how the heavens work. How do the planets go around the sun? How do the moons travel around their planets? How do the stars move across the sky? What are the rules and systems that are in place that God created in order to make this work? Like Milton, Newton is a devout Christian, and he actually spent a lot of his time also studying the Bible. But when he develops his theories of gravity, he starts to recognize that the cosmos, the celestial heavens, operate the same way the terrestrial Earth does. In other words, the rules that make the, the planets go around the sun are the same rules that make apples fall from trees. What are those rules? They're the rules of gravity. He writes this in the Principia Mathematica. He writes this over and over again, um, and he presents these ideas all throughout, um, all throughout Europe. And what he's looking at is he's showing he can predict where the planets will be with incredible accuracy using mathematics. What he's saying, though, is, is that he has decoded 
the secret messages of creation. He knows the language of God. He knows how God created the universe. God created the universe using mathematics. God's mind is mathematics. And for Newton, that means he understands a perfect cosmos using gravity and calculus. There's a problem though, and that problem is miracles. If you're going to have a perfect system that works in perfect harmony, you can't have supernatural things. You can't have miracles because that changes the rules and it has long-term effects. An analogy is often derived as from this is the watch and the watchmaker. So if you look at a watch and you take it apart, you notice that all the gears and gizmos are wound in perfect harmony to make the watch work. If you change one of those gears or if one of those things are timed incorrectly, the watch won't work anymore, right? So if the cosmos is a massive watch and everything is moving in, in these kind of like patterned ways and these orbits around everything, it has to be perfectly timed. You can't allow for things to get kind of shifted left or right because it would have massive effects, right? If Jupiter fell off of its kind of course and slammed into Mars, then Mars is gonna spin out of control. Everything has to be working in harmony. And Newton said, well, if the cosmos works in harmony, Earth also has to work in harmony because they are operating under the same rules. And that's why the miracles can't happen because if you have a miracle, then the watch wouldn't work anymore. If you have these gears perfectly timed and once in a while you just do anything you want willy-nilly, you'd throw the whole thing out of whack. So that leads people like Newton to start thinking of God as more of a watchmaker as opposed to a personal God. What that means is, God wound up the universe and created everything using the rules of mathematics, of calculus, of gravity. He made everything orbit. He tied everything perfectly. He created a perfect universe, but he steps back because if he were to interfere, he would not make, the, the universe wouldn't be able to work anymore. It would fall apart. So we had this idea of what was a watchmaker God, and this is the birth of deism. Deism is the opposite of theism in that theists do not believe that there is a personal God. They believe that there is a God, a supreme being of incredible intelligence beyond anything any mortal could fathom. And he uses that intelligence to create the universe, but he does not monkey with it once it's created. He winds up the gears and he steps back. He does not use miracles or the supernatural. So this leads us to some of the greatest experiments ever created from a deistic perspective. It leads us to Thomas Jefferson, who is one of the culminating figures of the Enlightenment period. Now remember, the Enlightenment period is this time which celebrates intellect, reason, and rationality. And it says things like miracles can't happen because we cannot prove them using experimentation, premise, logic, and reason. So although there's a lot of controversy about this, Thomas Jefferson was a deist. He began his life as a theist, and he struggled with religion throughout his life, but he did end his days as a deist, and we know this from a handful of things. Um, he kept pretty copious writings of his personal ideas. He wrote letters to John Adams, who was a rival and eventually a friend. But most importantly, he wrote The Life and Morals of Jesus of Nazareth, often known as the Jefferson Bible. This Bible removes the miracle. If God is the watchmaker God, if God created a perfect, harmonious universe, the miracles change that. And so therefore the miracles can't be there. So what Jefferson did is he took a knife and he started cutting out all the sections out of the Bible that had miracles. So virgin birth, turning wine from water into wine, walking on water, uh, raising the dead, miraculously healing the sick. He removed all these things. The entire Old Testament really didn't work for him because it's just full of supernatural 
of monsters and giants and angels and demons, and, you know, um, all these kinds of magic that he just said we couldn't prove with recent rationality. So the life and morals of Jesus of Nazareth is this very tiny book composed of the four gospels, so Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John, um, but it has no miracles in it. It's just the story and biography of Jesus, a teacher who shows people the righteous way to live through a moral life. Now, this thinking that Jefferson has has great implications in the world around him because if he's questioning God's motives on earth or God's involvement on earth, then one of the best places to see that being played out is rule. Who rules the world at his time? Monarchs. And who are these monarchs? Kings and queens who have been chosen by God to rule. They have divine right. If you look at the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, right, all the way throughout history, kings and queens are literally adorned. They're given a crown by people like the Pope and religious leaders, right? Spokesmen for God. God is choosing who should rule the world. Well, Jefferson's questioned this because Jefferson doesn't believe that God is meddling in these affairs. He's a deist. He believes that God is a watchmaker. So then what gives the king the right to rule? What gives a queen the right to take over? What gives them the right to conquer land? What gives them the right to tell other people how to live? And he reasons it's their own minds. It's not somehow a divinely inspired way. And because of that, he reasons that's wrong. That is not a righteous path. Those people stole that power. They're not entitled to it. They're lying about how they got it. They're lying about how they use it. And they're unjust. They're just as flawed and just full of sin, just like any other mortal. Now, Jefferson was a devout Christian. He just believed in this deistic version of it. He believed in Jesus' teachings. He just had a problem with this idea that kings and queens would derive their power from a divine right. So. In the Declaration of Independence, one of the things that Jefferson co-authored, along with a lot of the other founding fathers who were also deists, like Benjamin Franklin and John Adams, they start to question this idea and they say, no more. There is no divine right. We will have a country that rules through logic and reason. We will look at the great thinkers of ancient Greece and Rome. We'll look at things like the deistic teachings of the philosophers of Thomas, um, of Thomas Hobbes and John Locke and Rousseau and these major philo philosophical thinkers. And we will govern our nation through philosophy because what is the United States of America? It's a code of ethics. It's a code of rules. It's reason. It's rationality. It's law. The government of the United States is created by law, and law is derived from logic. That was the argument. The argument was that we can do a better job creating a, a, a government and a country and a nation than just allowing nature to take its course, allowing certain kings to rise to power and say that the reason they have that power is because God chose them. This is the great American experiment. It's a premise backed up by testing and evidence, which leads to a conclusion. Now, there was another figure in history, another deist, who really celebrated what Jefferson was trying to do. And that is William Blake. And this kind of ends the Enlightenment period. So we start with John Milton at the beginning of the Enlightenment. We get all the way through the end towards um, William Blake, who was actually a romantic as well. Um, so the ro romantics actually thought that you could use your emotion, and things like love and nature and beauty to understand the universe. Um, Blake was kind of a blend of the two. He also believed in the intellect and the power of the mind. Now, Blake loved America. He thought America was a brilliant idea, but he also found America to be very tragic. He thought America fell short of its great purpose. You see, Blake was incredibly forethinking for his time. This is a person who didn't believe in slavery, 
believed that all the races of the world were equal, believed that women were equal, and that the genders were equal, and that women were just as intellectual as men. And he thought America fell short because it did not fulfill those lives and those prophecies. Now, Blake is from England. He's a British uh, person. And so when he looks at what America is doing, he says, you know, this is amazing. They're overthrowing this, this king that is, you know, taking advantage of, of, of rules that aren't necessarily true, that aren't reasonable, that are miraculous. And you'll look at Blake's work, and Blake is highly influenced by a lot of the thinkers we just talked about. So over here on the right, this is painting is known as the Ancient of Days. And this is a picture of God creating the universe using a compass. He's inscribing the circles of the planets using the tool of a mathematician. The days of creation aren't being created by miracles, they're created by mathematics. The bottom down here, this is actually a picture of Isaac Newton doing the same thing. But look at how Newton looks. He's, he's not the normal picture that we see of him. He looks like Apollo, the Greek god, right? He's incredibly physically fit and he's luminous. He's lit up by light. And he too is inscribing and measuring the universe, right? Now it's not, Blake didn't think that Newton was somehow this you know, larger than life figure physically, but he did so in the terms of ideas and the ideas of philosophy. And then we've got this top picture here, which is very controversial because it's actually a picture of Lucifer. See, Blake did a series of paintings and engravings for Paradise Lost. And he depicts Lucifer not as a bat-winged devil or some kind of evil figure, but Blake depicts Lucifer as a hero. He, too, is not a Satan worshiper, so we have to be very careful with this. He does not believe in evil. What he believes is, is that mankind should revolt and rebel against tradition and authority. It's our duty to use our minds for righteous purposes, to live a moral life, to be a good person, but to do so in contrast to things like organized religion, which he had issues with. See, so he celebrates Lucifer in the sense that Lucifer challenges authority and embraces knowledge. He embraces this Lucifer figure that's like Prometheus, who's being punished because he didn't follow the rules. And for Blake, not following the rules is actually the best use of our creativity and our passion and our love. Okay, so we've got these four figures and we're charting the progress from theism to deism throughout the Enlightenment period, Enlightenment period but also the, the early birth of what's gonna become the 20th century ideals. We're shifting from that idea of a very personal God to a watchmaker God, and then to the idea that you don't use spirituality to understand the universe, you use reason and logic. You don't use uh, you know, the ancient texts to understand the world, you use science and the experimentation and the, the principles of the 